Good evening, readers, and welcome to Tilly's Shelf. Today, I'm going to be doing something a little bit different. So, I haven't made a video in a little while. Uh, basically, this is my one day off at the moment, and then I'm working tomorrow. Then on Tuesday, I'm getting on a train and travelling all the way to Brighton to see my lovely family, and then to London to see some friends, which is wonderful. But it does mean that I won't have that much time to actually do the whole filming thing. So, November at the moment isn't really going according to plan. And I had a couple of things that I wanted to do on this day off, and I haven't managed to do all of them. And one of them was to make some models out of clay, ready for hopefully some like Christmassy ones that I can maybe glaze in time for Christmas, which I may well not be able to do. And one of them was to make a video. So I'm combining these two things. So we're going to see how this goes. One channel that I really, really like, it's a channel called Old Voo's Chapter and Verse, and the guy is called Jason, he's lovely, and he does these kind of like rambles with the yarn where he's like, I think he's crocheting and talking at the same time about books. And I thought, yeah, I can do a ramble with the clay instead of yarn. <laughs> what I'm trying to do is make a nice, very round ball, and then I'm going to hollow it out and make some patterns on it, probably. And then that is going to be a bauble. I have a couple of video ideas that I've been working on. So I was working on a script for a video about World War One poetry. Didn't finish in time for Remembrance Sunday, for the centenary of the end of World War One. So that's probably never going to get finished. I am working on, I finished the book Narrow Road to the Deep North by Matsuo Basho, which I said I was going to read for non-fiction in November. I have read it, but I've now lent it to a friend who wants to read it. A lot of the people who have seen me reading that book have said, oh, can I read it? Like, it's obviously got that thing about it that m interests people. So I think the video on that is going to wait until either she gives it back or I, I don't know when it's going to happen. And I'm, I'm working on one of the things that I mentioned in my non-fiction November plan, which nothing has really gone according to plan, I'm going to get pottery clay over everything now, was I said that I was going to do a review of these three books that were made by Wooden Books. And planning, and planning, and planning, and planning towards making videos, it, it's not actually getting me anywhere. So I thought, if you don't mind it being a little bit more informal and casual and not necessarily that in-depth, that I would just kind of chatty review them as opposed to in-depth review them. That, I'm quite pleased with that. I mean, it's not a perfect sphere, but nor is the planet, so all good. So yeah, so if you fire just a solid lump of clay, particularly if it might have any air bubbles in it, it, it will crack and it will have problems. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to dig out the centre of it and it will be like a hollow bubble. I feel like doing something with pottery at the same time as talking about these books is quite appropriate because these books are going to take us back into prehistory. I have just realised that my teaspoon is not going to be an appropriate tool for hollowing this out. Found a much smaller teaspoon. So for me it's a hobby, but for the people who were building Stonehenge and Avery, pottery was a vital skill. I can already tell that this is not going to work. Wow. The three books that we have here are Avery by Evelyn Francis, and she says in her introduction that she was significantly helped by Robin Heath, who made Stonehenge, and then there is also Chris Mansell made British Folk Art. And they each have like a cute little subtitle. The Recycled Ancient Wis Wisdom Saucer Book to Stonehenge, Temple of Ancient Britain. Avery, it says, a genuine magical places ancient wisdom source book. Avery and Ancient British Rock Art it says the world's only recycled pocket book of ancient British rock art a guide to indigenous stone carvings and I think just looking at the covers of those books you can get the kind of idea of what kind of angle that they take there's a great line I think it's in the Stonehenge book where it talks about like odd theories about Stonehenge and it says I think it's from a an archaeologist from the time dismissing all of these theories and things as like the loony fringe of dotty archaeology. These books incline towards that side. They're very open towards that side. I don't think it's a problem if you know that already and you're willing to take it with a pinch of salt as you are reading it. We bought these books at Stonehenge. We went to Stonehenge in July. Another video that I mentioned in the non-fiction November plan was a vlog that I did about Oak and Ash and Thorn by, I'm reliably informed that his name is pronounced Fines, Peter Fines, which I don't know if I'll post because it's like 40 minutes of me talking about a book that none of you guys will have heard of and walking through a wood and stuff, but actually 
I was reading Oak and Ash and Thorn at the same time as we went to Stonehenge. There's like a little bit about Stonehenge in that. Should it were to be posted? Should, should it, if it if it were to be posted? Yes. When we do get some time off, we tend to go on road trips around England, and England has got a lot of very interesting sites kind of dotted around historical, prehistorical sites. We're quite lucky in that, and we are, are quite lucky, myself and Bo, in that we can just sort of get into our car and say, okay, we're going to go see this castle. Okay, we're going to see go see this stone circle. In July, we were going to this music festival, and we said, okay, that's relatively near to Stonehenge, so. We're just going to go to Stonehenge. So we bought these books at Stonehenge, that's what I'm trying to say, and I just keep getting distracted by tangents. And we bought another book as well, which was the official English Heritage Guidebook to Stonehenge, which has got a huge amount of detail and interesting stuff in it about both Stonehenge and the wider landscape. So between reading this book and reading the Stonehenge book, I've got kind of like the basic guide to Stonehenge pretty much down. So Stonehenge, I I'm remembering here because I can't really, my hands are really clay now, so I can't really pick up the books. Stonehenge, I think it was, it's about 5,000 years old now. I think it was built around 3,200 BC. And in saying that, I'm saying something slightly false because it wasn't just built, like it didn't just spring out of nowhere and people just um, created it. Although that is one of the things that Evelyn Francis says in the um, Avery book. She does make the point that there was very little before these huge monuments and then People just came along and created these monuments pretty much out of nowhere and then disappeared back into nowhere. Like, we don't know that much else about these cultures. But what we do know about Stonehenge is that it didn't, although it is quite isolated in terms of we don't know that much else, it didn't appear overnight. There was a system of stages in that it went from being selection of ditches to being a selection of potentially smaller wooden or stone posts. Um, and then eventually into the huge sarsen circle that we know today, um, which has since deteriorated. So what these books do is they basically, they do like one page per topic and talk about theories about Stonehenge. Some of it is fact, some of it is like things that I've, like what I've just told you that certain things happened before, other things and all of that. But some of it is speculation. And speculation is good. I think we are fascinated as humans, we are fascinated by these very, very ancient sites and we want to understand them and we want to know, you know, what's all that about, what went on there. We want to know why it happened. And that's the question that it is next to impossible to answer. So we know what happened, more or less. We can create very reliable theories, very, like, testable theories for how they could have moved the stones to their locations, for example. And the English Heritage Guide is very good at looking at that and explaining like where each stone came from and how they could have made the stones stand upright and things like that. We can figure out what they did and potentially how they did it. We can never know why they did what they did, but it is very fun to speculate and that is what um, these books are doing, they're speculating. So um, I'm going to try and show you actually. So this book is filled with little maps and things that tell you how Stonehenge could be used to predict eclipses and solar events and lunar events, which makes a lot of sense. Um, and it talks about like different alignments of different stone circles and just how they could have been used. Oh, I was thinking I can't find any of my notes, but here they are. Yeah, and just things that we can kind of deduce that maybe tell us something. So what I need to do is I need to make a handle, something that can be, be suspended from. There's always a bit that you can't glaze, and I don't know whether that bit should be at the bottom or at the top. I think at the bottom, because then you can tie the, um, at the top, sorry, because then you can tie the ribbon around it and you won't notice that it's not glazed. It makes the point that if you had a, so it's easy to say Druids, Stonehenge, Avery, the ancient rock art, all of that massively predates what we think of as the, the Celts and the Druids, which was immediately pre-Roman, and these were long, long, long before that, 3200 BC or something. So there was a massive gap between the Druids and Stonehenge and Avery and things like that. Um, but if you had like a Druidic priest or a an, an ancient Stonehenge priest who could whoop, predict lunar eclipses, predict solar eclipses, or seem to even cause solar or lunar eclipses, they would have a lot of power in a, in, a, in that kind of society, presumably. So I'm just like cross hatching to be able to stick the connector across. I should be doing this with slick, but I normally do pottery at a pottery um, class, and I just took some clay home to try and play around with it. 
so I don't actually have the, the right stuff really. Can you tell that I'm completely lost? I'm making up both of these things as I'm going along. So I think the best of these three books is the Stonehenge book actually. The worst is probably the rock art book. So thanks to the rock art book, Bo and I have been able to go and actually physically see some British rock art in um, Northumberland. Let's see if I can find it actually. Luna, you're not allowed on the table. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure we went to see this one here in Northumberland. Pretty sure. Might be wrong. Which is like up on a moor. It was actually incredibly difficult to find and we were not the only people who had decided to make the journey to try to see this ancient art that were wandering around above this uh, golf course trying to find it. So the ancient British rock art is more of a kind of just like a a yellow pages of rock art. The yellow pages, I don't know whether that's a thing in other countries, is just like a, a massive directory that people don't use it anymore because of the internet. But it's like a yellow pages of rock art. Um, it just kind of tells you what sites there are and what is there and it's like, oh, here are some sites where there are some sharp angles and here are some sites where there are some dots. And it talks about like cotton ring markings and things like that. I'm really beginning to wish that I'd planned this a little bit better. I found the rock art book a lot less interesting to read. I felt like it gave me some ideas of places that we could go to, and it did, because we did then go to places. I'm just gonna go get a fork. So it's good to make a pattern that a glaze will interact with. So um, if you have like ridges, then your glaze will kind of like sit in the ridges and you'll get like a different look based on that. So I think I'm gonna do like circles around it basically. Um, Actually, in one of these, there's, there's some more of my notes. Yeah, the Beckhampton pot. So this is a pot, I don't know whether it's one of the beaker pots, but it is, I think it probably is actually, because you can see it's got this like really kind of crazy intricate design on it, which the beakers were kind of known for. At A3, there is a museum called the Alexander Keeler Museum, and they have loads and loads of finds from around the sites, including like antler picks and so on. They have got some pots that were found that date to a similar time to sort of A3, which I think um, itself is dated to slightly before Stonehenge and they there is a, a cool little exhibit showing how they think some of the pots were decorated and they've got like bird bones and show how the bird bones could be used to make the patterns so they've just found things that make interesting patterns and imprinted it on the clay and that is just what pottery is all about finding things that make a bit of a pattern and just putting it on the clay. So I am gonna do that with a fork. So Avery, I should probably actually tell you what Avery is because it's not as well known as Stonehenge. So Avery is another stone circle. It is actually a lot bigger than Stonehenge. Wow, I'm just really ruining this. I was going for like a nice elegant wave. It's got like cat hair stuck in it. This is why I go to a specific place to do these things. Avery is a stone circle or a collection of a stone circles. So it's like a circle with a couple of circles inside the circle. I'm gonna have to erase all of that. It is huge. If you go there, you can really realise like it is huge. And the stones, it's not like Stonehenge is very, very fenced off. But Avery, you can really just walk around next to the stones and they are twice the height of me. They are twice my height. They didn't travel as far as the Stonehenge stones. In fact, this is kind of the area where the stones for Stonehenge really came from. So they came from like the, the downland quite nearby it. And there is a kind of a town um, or a village that overlaps with the stone circle. So as time went on, this area around the circle was integrated into the town. And there are some cool stories in the museum actually of people going in there and, and smashing up the stones because they were fed up of them being sort of in the way of the town. In fact, actually in the Stonehenge book, there's similar, there's a, um, there's a record of people applying to take Stonehenge down in 1916 because it was a risk to low-flying aircraft um, which is just like shocking that people at that stage even when it was already recognized as quite important as quite an important historical site that people would be thinking about just getting rid of it because it was in the way of the planes. I think it's supposedly the largest stone circle on earth that's what it says on the back of this book I just literally read that straight from the back of this book. Avery is the largest stone circle on earth. Silbury, Silbury Hill is as old as the Great Pyramid. What is the secret geometry of the ancient stones? Was a lost science once practiced here? Yeah, and both of these books, they talk about things like dowsing and they produce like dowsing maps and they talk about like lines, like ley lines and how a lot of ancient sites line up along lines. I mean, it's interesting and it's one of those things that like, it's quite hard to refute. 
So Avery is the centre of something called the Michael Line that runs from St Michael's Mount at the far tip of Cornwall um, to the far eastern point of um, the bottom part of Britain, so west to east. There is this long straight line and Avery is on it and Glastonbury is on it and another couple of ancient sites are on it. And yeah, it's possible that Stone Age people knew of that alignment and deliberately chose to build Avery in a line with Glastonbury. Like it is, it is fully possible that they cleared straight paths through what would then have been largely forest. It's also quite unlikely, and, and I guess you, you, you'd you look at like probabilities, what's the probability that these sites just kind of ended up on the same alignment? Still just trying to gradually get rid of the dents that I made with the fork that didn't work out. I've nearly smoothed off all of the problems. Okay, how do you like that? That's like with a fork going around in a circle, if you couldn't tell. Little kind of stars. Cool, I'm gonna make another one. Well, let's see if there's anything interesting in these notes that I made. Oh yeah, that they both, the Avery and the Stonehenge book, they kind of go together a little bit better and they talk about like interpretations of those sites. Somebody called William Stukeley was very influential in how we see these sites because he was the first guy to kind of go around and try to like categorize them. And he thought that Britain was Atlantis. So when the great Greeks talk about these Atlantan islands with this kind of incredible culture to them, um, that they are talking about Britain and Stonehenge and Avery were like the works of Atlantis. All of these monuments, they kind of sit in a wider landscape of like barrows, lots and lots of barrows, which were like burial sites by and large. Ridgeways, ancient paths, ancient, the rock carvings is another example, like just little details from which we would attempt to piece together the world that they lived in. And I think that's what makes the Stonehenge and Avery books a little bit better than the rock art book, because the rock art book is really... I mean, I tried to describe it as a directory. I think I went off on a tangent before I finished that thought. It doesn't do that thing of speculating why these things were made, and it doesn't do that thing of kind of talking more about the people who potentially made these things. And that's why it's less good. It's probably more factual, because it really does just say what we do know. But I don't want that. I want some speculation, and it doesn't really um, have that. And if you look at the markings that it shows, actually, like even you can just see from the cover, like you feel like they have to mean something. They're not, they're not purely decorative. I mean, I'm not saying that they look ugly, but they don't look as nice as something that was purely decorative would look because humans are obsessed with patterns and they're not very pattern-like. They look more like maps or even writing and he doesn't really speculate on that. And it sounds like not many people have speculated on that. It sounds like from what I would gather from that book, which might not be the actual truth, if you know anything about this, do let me know. But it sounds like there is not an awful lot of research into what this could have been and like mapping them together and, and comparing and contrasting them and trying to kind of decoding hieroglyphic style, working out what they could represent. There's not much dating, I don't know whether that's because the dates of them aren't really known, but I was left kind of unclear as to where the rock art fitted in the pattern of prehistory, like is it more towards the Stone Age, is it more towards the Iron Age, do we simply not know? I felt like those are some questions that I was expecting the rock art book to answer. In conclusion, those are my thoughts. What else have I got to say? I'm sorry for the state of this video, which has been chaos, but I just, I wanted to make something because it's been too long and if I leave it much longer, there's a lot of things that I want to do, like that World War One thing, I want to finish my Victober videos, maybe be sometime before next Victober. There just doesn't seem to be that much space to do that. Um, and I know that Christmas is coming up, I know that there's a lot of stuff that we need to do for Christmas. So here we go, I'm nearly to my second bauble. So it'll be like a pair of baubles. I thought it was gonna be a set, but a pair is better than nothing. The bridge isn't kind of long enough to get across the, oh. Uh oh, this is supposed to be the thing that the uh, ribbon will hang from when the bauble is done. The other thing that is going on, and I can't really touch the book with my hands because they are very pottery hands, but I am participating in a read-along. Um, and it's a read-along of The Scarlet Letter, and it is hosted by Kelly at Books I'm Not Reading, who I don't need to recommend to you that you go and check out her channel because actually the majority of people who comment down here, I have seen commenting on Kelly's videos as well. So I know that you already know how lovely, sweet and wonderful she is. But she decided to do a read along of The Scarlet Letter and I managed to sort out my library membership finally. So I got a copy from the library. I'm gonna try and pick it up without really touching it. Yeah, the, uh, the stamp sheet, if you flick back, it's like got a couple of layers to it. And the first stamp for somebody taking it out is from 1982, which is quite cool, like knowing that I've got something that's been passed through so many hands. And actually a lot of people have left 
biro annotations to it. I'm really enjoying it so far. I've read actually the first 11 chapters, which is the point that I should be up to. I haven't managed the customs house yet. I was I was trying to read it on my break on a night shift and I could not, I couldn't cope. So I skipped ahead to the first chapter because I was like, is the whole book going to be like this? Because if it is, I'm just going to quit now. And I hopefully will make a video about that. That's a little bit of me in my life right now. Thank you very much for watching as always. I'm very nearly done on my second bauble, which considering at half past eight, I decided that I was gonna try to simultaneously make a video and make some play baubles. And it is now quarter to 10 and I've got two baubles and a whole entire mess of video. So potentially that's quite a productive couple of hours. We'll see how the video turns out, but pretty pleased with the baubles. Actually, I'm gonna put a star pattern on the bottom of each of them as well. This one's a lot heavier than this one. Quite unevenly sized, but it's okay. People like handmade things that are not perfectly made. So I'm gonna biscuit fire them, then I'm gonna see if there's any time before Christmas, and if there is time, then I will white glaze them like little snowballs and use an oxide or an underglaze to, to bring out the, the patterns that I've got on them. So they have to dry quite a lot before they can be fired actually, so I might not be able to fire them yet, purely because they won't be dry. There will just be decorations for next Christmas. So I'll leave these out to dry slightly and then I will take them with me to the place where I do pottery to get them fired. As always, I would love to hear from any and all of you in the comments. Um, I'm sorry if it takes me a little while to get back to you on comments because obviously I'm going away for a little while and then when I get back from that I'm straight back on tonight so I struggle to reply to comments on nights like I can read them but then I can't function to formulate a reply. Honestly, my excuse for everything in my life ever is <laughs> night shifts. I realise it looks quite threatening that I'm just smoothing a knife against the side of the table. I'm just trying to get some of the clay off. I was using it to cut the lumps of clay. So take care, lovely readers. I need to go to bed because actually after all of this talk about night shifts, I'm on a day shift tomorrow, which means getting up at five o'clock. Okay, goodbye.